One impression of the First World War haunts us perhaps more than any other, that of thousands of brave men condemned to a futile death by the incompetence of the generals that led them. On the 1st of July 1916, the British began their offensive on the Somme. The pictures I'm watching were filmed on or about that date. The faces of men about to go into battle, many of them not to survive it. The British Army lost more men that day than on any other before or since. So were these men the victims of blundering commanders who just wanted to move their drinks cabinets another couple of inches closer to Berlin? Or was this the necessary price of war? The 1916 offensive on the Somme was the largest operation the British Army had ever mounted. At its start, half a million men were involved. Most were volunteers who had been sent to the front with inadequate training. The British were under pressure to attack as soon as they could to relieve the beleaguered French army at Verdun. It was agreed to mount the offensive astride the Somme, where the two armies met. The British would attack over a front 18 miles long north of the river. The British had a new man for the job. General Sir Douglas Haig had taken over from Field Marshal Sir John French as Commander-in-Chief in December 1915. He was well-connected and ambitious and had been instrumental in supplanting French, whom he regarded as quite unfit for high command in time of crisis. Somehow it's hard to like First World War generals. They seem comfortable, well-breakfasted, privileged and remote. The uniform doesn't help. Bridged, booted and spurred, they ride or stride about a world of chateau and staff conferences. Small wonder that one British veteran said that all senior officers should have been strangled at birth. Actually, it wasn't always an easy life. 58 British generals were killed on the Western Front. But as a group, they tended to show more courage than imagination. Haig embodied much of what was best and worst about the British High Command. He was a hard-working lowland Scot who took his profession very seriously. While he was open to new ideas, he was not inclined to listen to subordinates and found it hard to tolerate opposition, even when it was loyal and constructive. Throughout the war, he remained a remote figure. He was single-minded about winning and believed that blood was indeed the price of victory. It wasn't that he didn't care, but that he thought it a price which simply had to be paid. In 1916, Haig's general headquarters moved to Montreuil, near the coast, 50 miles from the Somme. Overnight, 5,000 officers and men arrived to provide support for the coming offensive. But many didn't actually want to be here. One of the British Army's problems was that so many of its staff-trained officers had gone off with their regiments in 1914 and been killed in the first six months. Those who replaced them were often just as anxious to get off to the front. They had to bear the music hall joke which said that since bread was the staff of life, the life of the staff was one long loaf. Not so. Most staff officers found it hard to get out of the office. The most that they could hope for was a turn round the ramparts or a game of tennis on a court they'd had specially built. It must have been a relief to come up for air after spending the day down here. These huge chambers beneath the walls of the town's citadel house technology 
that was fast changing the old ways of doing war. This was the nerve center of GHQ, the telephone exchange. Rows of telephone operators manned the exchange day and night, routing a constant stream of messages from London and other headquarters. But it was easier to receive a message from London than it was to get one from the front line. An extensive network of telephone lines had been laid to the front, but wires were often cut by enemy shell fire. When a line went down, the troops had to keep in touch by runner, dispatch rider, or pigeon. This medieval tower was converted into a pigeon loft to serve GHQ. Haig himself trusted pen, paper, and personal contact far more than his telephone. But here, in his quarters at the Chateau de Beaurepaire, four kilometers from Montreuil, the drinks cabinet did indeed have a vital role to play. On the 26th of May, Haig entertained General Joff, the French commander-in-chief. When he suggested that the British army might not be ready to attack till August, the Frenchman exploded. He said that the French army would cease to exist if we did nothing till then. Haig agreed to bring the date forward. He noted in his diary, they are indeed difficult allies to deal with, but there can be no doubt that the nearest way to the hearts of many of them, including the Generalissimo, is down their throats. And some 1840 brandy had a surprisingly soothing effect. Haig was right to be worried about the readiness of his troops. The high casualties suffered in the early part of the war had decimated the regular army. Those now in command often rose too far, too fast, and they were leading men with too little training. Small wonder that GHQ was sure that this was not a real army. It must be remembered that officers and troops generally do not possess that military knowledge arising from a long and high state of training. They have become used to deliberate action based on precise and detailed orders. The inexperience of the troops meant that there could be no flexibility in the battle plan. But what precisely was that plan to be? At Kerrier, eight miles from the front, General Sir Henry Rawlinson set up his headquarters. He commanded the British Fourth Army, whose task it was to engage on the Somme. Rawlinson stuck his battle map over this mirror. It described in detail how he planned to attack. He knew that the German defences were very strong and believed that success would depend on pulverising them with artillery. He favoured what he called bite and hold. First, smashing the German front line with a deliberate bombardment, and then occupying it methodically, trench by trench. Rawlinson wrote in his diary that he foresaw a tussle with Haig over the limited objective, for I understand he's inclined to favour the unlimited with a chance of breaking the German line. He was right. Haig told him to plan on going far deeper. He wanted a quick breakthrough so that the cavalry would pour through the gap and roll up the German line. Rawlinson knew that this would involve considerable risks. And then he gave way, saying that it might be necessary to run these risks if it was the Commander-in-Chief's wish. Like so many of his ilk, Rawlinson was physically brave. But at moments like this, his moral courage let him down. When Rawlinson briefed his commanders here at Carrier, he was underwhelmed by their enthusiasm, for they too had doubts. He wrote, the corps commanders took it very well, and there were hardly any questions. 
Then, in an atmosphere of pregnant silence, he added, it might not be possible to break the German line and push cavalry through at the first rush. Ominously, he warned that any criticism of superior authorities would, in the end, rebound on the heads of the critics. While the high command wrestled with its doubts, the great build-up intensified. It had been decided that the offensive would start with a massive bombardment designed to smash the enemy's defences and break his capacity to fight. Verdun had already proved that this was fast becoming a gunner's war. The ammunition restrictions of 1915 were a thing of the past. British shell production was reaching maximum effort. Over a million and a half shells had been stockpiled for the attack. To shift them, narrow gauge railways like this had been commandeered or built to service the 18 miles of attacking frontage. Linked to the main lines, they moved munitions to where they were needed. The bombardment was to start seven days before the attack. belt of wire, supported on pickets like this, stretched out in front of the German trench. The fact that these have survived for over 80 years is an indication of just how robust the structure was. Wire cutting by artillery required good observation and a shell that burst the second it grazed the wire. Inexperienced observers or bad fuses might simply move the wire about rather than cut it. Alternatively, you could use wire cutters like this, but it took a long time to hack your way through 20 yards of wire. Contradictory reports on the effect of the bombardment went back to Rawlinson. Some patrols reported the wire cut. Others found it scarcely damaged. Less than two days before the assault, Rawlinson wrote, I am not quite satisfied that all the wire has been thoroughly well cut. The Germans had dug deep into the ground. The bombardment may have smashed trenches, but it had failed to make much impression on dugouts up to 40 feet under the Picardy chalk. Ammunition was notoriously unreliable. About one third of the shells fired failed to explode. A British private soldier, Rifleman Percy Jones, wrote in his diary, I do not see how the stiffest bombardment will kill them all off, nor do I see how the whole of the enemy's artillery will be silenced. The bombardment also had a limited effect on concrete bunkers behind the German front line. They needed direct hits by heavy shells. This one has survived the whole of the battle and another world war. But it must have been ghastly to be cooped up here while the shelling went on. A German medical officer remembered that even the rats panicked and sought refuge here. They climbed the walls and had to be killed with spades.
There's no doubt that the news about uncut wire, shells that didn't explode, and deep German dugouts filtered back to British commanders. So why was there no contingency plan? Like so many of us, they wanted to believe that they were right. Where there were conflicting reports, they tended to believe the more positive. The plan, based on its assumption that the artillery would achieve its objectives, was too large and too elaborate to be modified. Even Haig was unsure about a quick breakthrough and warned all must be prepared for heavy casualties. His intelligence officer admitted that very night, we do not expect any great advance. We're fighting primarily to wear down the German armies and the German nation. But the men who were checking their kit and writing their last letters had something else in mind. They had come to the Somme to win the war. One guesses that it is all going to be huge and hideous. It is best, I feel sure, to keep hold of the faithfulness of God and to share in the confidence that this effort will be a success and bring peace quickly. You can hear the gunfire all the time, and it gets louder and louder, and you go up in a communication trench, and the communication trench, you go to a reserve trench, and the reserve trench, you go to a front line trench. Obviously, you're scared. Everybody, everybody's scared. But you don't show it, at least I hope you don't. Nobody else seemed to show it, so I hope I didn't. The attack was to begin with the largest man-made explosion the world had ever seen. Mines had been dug beneath German strongpoints and were to be detonated minutes before the assault. Geoffrey Malins, an official war cameraman, had set up his camera here overlooking Hawthorne Ridge Redoubt, amongst the trees just opposite. At 7.30, zero hour, there was a silence that was almost palpable. Men later commented on the bird song, on what promised to be a fine, sunny morning. Then the air was rent by shouts and whistles as men clambered out of their trenches and began to advance across the short strip of land separating the two positions. They were ordered forward in waves a hundred yards apart. They were told to walk, not run, to keep going whatever the opposition. The grand plan so complacently drawn up had taken no account of German guns still being in place. The English came walking as though they were going to the theatre or as though they were on a parade ground. We felt they were mad. Our orders were given in complete calm and every man took careful aim to avoid wasting ammunition. July the 1st, 1916 was the black day of the British Army. It suffered over 57,000 casualties, over 20,000 dead. For this, it had advanced about a mile into the German lines, on a front of three and a half miles. In many places, the attack failed completely. There was just a rain of bullets coming at you from right, left and centre. It was uh, it was terrifying, really. It was it was one of the worst things of all. I mean, heavy shell fire—you could hear the darn things coming. 
expert machine gun bullets now. All you hear is a continual clatter, and you know all the time there's death flying around. It took several weeks before the sheer scale of the casualty rate began to filter through to the people at home. In August, film of the first day, the first footage of real war that most people had ever seen was shown in cinemas around the country. It had a sobering effect. For the first time, the people at home had an opportunity to share the experience of the soldiers at the front. There was a, a well-known complaint among the soldiers in particular that the people left behind at home really had no understanding at all of what they were going through at the front. And it was felt, at least among the people at home, that this film was really giving them the ability to identify with what their, what their menfolk were going through. There's a story in the Daily Mirror of a woman crying out in an otherwise silent cinema, my God, they're dead. And there was a very uh, lengthy debate in the correspondence column of the Times about whether these scenes should actually be shown in the cinema at all. I think that most people actually felt that seeing the moment of death and dying was a very important part of identifying with the experience of the soldiers on the Western Front. You know you've been hit. You don't know how badly, particularly where you can't see. If it's in your arm or your leg, you can see it. But if it's in your back, you can't see anything. So you just know you've been hit. So the thing, first thing you do instinctively, you're on the ground. And then you find when your arms and legs work, uh, 101 things go through your mind absolutely in a flash. You don't think about it at all. It's instinctively. It, it happens. You think, and say, well, I've got to get out of this somehow. So you start trying to crawl back from the way you came. Whatever people's private thoughts, support for the war did not fall away. Few questioned how a plan so meticulously drawn up had gone so disastrously wrong. Yet there were voices raised. Lieutenant Billy Lipscomb of the Dorsets wrote, don't mention the word staff to me or I shall be ill. Somebody ought to be hung for this show. Tragically, the catastrophe of the first day was only the start. This is High Wood. By repute, ghastly by day, ghostly by night, the rottenest place on the Somme. For two months, the front line ran over that crest to Delville Wood. For two months, 4th Army lost 82,000 men for small gain, trying to take these woods and the trench systems around them. Most British attacks were followed by German counterattacks, often just as costly. The Somme had become a battle of attrition, where advances were measured in enemy lives lost, not in ground gain. Men died unnecessarily in piecemeal engagements. The same objectives were attacked time and time again by too few soldiers behind too light a barrage. Mounting losses and small gains brought Hague under pressure from British politicians. And he responded by leaning heavily on Rawlinson, urging him to coordinate his attacks better. The British simply had to try something different. Haig was eager for Rawlinson to exploit a new weapon that had been shipped secretly to France. The tank, it was hoped, would break the deadlock. But once more, Haig's optimism revealed the division between him and Rawlinson. Haig wanted the tank used boldly and in mass. Rawlinson was less confident. He thought the tanks were unreliable and could easily break down on the battlefield. He was perfectly right. On the 15th of September, the British attacked again all along the line. There were 49 tanks lined up for the assault. Only 32 started. One came down this road. A war correspondent reported, tank 
walking up the high street of Fleur with the British army cheering behind it. But the euphoria was short-lived. The attack took another great bite out of the German line, but did not break it. The Germans could still reinforce their failure quicker than the British could reinforce their success. Haig trusted his intelligence experts, who believed that the Germans were near their last gasp. Prisoners were disillusioned, but then prisoners usually are. Yet the Somme was unquestionably an ordeal for the Germans. We are actually fighting on the Somme against the English. You can no longer call it war. It is mere murder. When you read these lines, I shall no longer be among the living. I shall have breathed my last before the enemy of the Somme. I could not prevent Prussian militarism from driving me to death. Some Germans were now very young. Haig's intelligence officer wrote, if the weather holds, we shall have worked through them pretty quickly. How wrong he was. Despite its growing burden of casualties, the German army was still capable of enormous endurance. The battle ground to a halt up here in November, only about eight miles from where it started. On the horizon, we can see the spires of Bapaume, which should have been reached in the first week of July. Haig's vision of a summer breakthrough had been blurred by the winter mud. The Somme had become a British Verdun. Many soldiers remembered it as pure waste, sheer slaughter. And winning and losing, a German officer described the Somme as the muddy grave of the German field army and of faith in the infallibility of German leadership. In terms of sheer attrition, the Somme was an Allied victory. But at what a cost? Out of the wreckage of the Somme arose a British army that was tougher and more experienced. But the price, beyond question, was far too high.